Would you think of yourself as a natural born leader? And if you're not a natural born leader, what can you look back that sort of pushed you or led you into a leadership role in your later life? Jump in, I'm not calling on you, it's not class. <laughs> I'll jump in. So I don't think that leadership was something as a, as a girl that I, I, I didn't understand the construct of what leadership was or what it meant. Um, although um, there were leaders in my life and the primary leaders that you would have um, growing up um, in a low income community in which I did in the California Central Valley, I grew up in Stockton, California, that my teacher would be the closest thing and teachers would be the closest leaders that I knew. Uh, ministers um, at the church would be leaders because of their pastoral role. Um, and leadership within the community, particularly the African-American community. Um, my parents were leaders because, you know, um, they were in control of me. Um, um, and um, that, that essentially was the, the realm. But as I progressed and eventually was able to um, uh, go to college, I was able to understand that leadership is, 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 is a form, formative process. It's a uh, and it's a it's happening while you don't recognize that it's happening, and so the to answer your question directly, you know, this idea is one born a leader or does one become a leader? I think that it is neither, uh, it is not either or, but it is and and both. Because essentially what I have discovered is that there is a legacy that has come through my own family, through my own community, um, that um, uh, has the principles and the qualities of leadership that was in my community all around me that I didn't know it, but I was witnessing it because I was living in it. Um, and um, the, but I had to develop through school, through work, through challenges um, that allowed me to understand exactly what are the qualities um, and the tenets um, um, that makes an individual a leader. So I think leadership um, is something that um, uh, is in, within every individual, but it's part of their environment um, and it's a part of the responsibility of the people within their environment to help them find that pathway um, to become the individual, the leader who they're really meant to be. Yeah, I, I agree. It's both a um, innate sense um, as well as something you evolve into. So um, I would say it was probably more uh, I never considered myself a leader, particularly in, in school or high school, as, but I, my family taught me to, if you see a problem, go fix it, and it's on you to fix it. No one else is going to fix your problems for you, so you better do that yourself. And what I discovered much later was that, that those are attributes that people view as leaders. And so, for example, uh, my freshman year of high school, uh, there was a, um, an existing group in my school that would visit migrants every week. Um, and help them with school, try and keep them in school for, you know, you battle for every six months, hey, don't get pregnant at 13, wait until 14. Um, and uh, and uh, so that was what we did. And I became the natural leader of, of the group because I, you know, I had ideas and, and so on. Uh, but I actually didn't come into a formal leadership position until much, much later. Um, uh, when I was working my first job out of school, I got technical degrees in electrical enge engineering, computer science, so I was, I was a geek, I was a techie. Um, and one of the things you discover um, as a techie is you're in a position of great control because you're working in a company and other positions really support you. And that, I think, helps shape my, my sort of world view. And when I was eventually promoted to become a, a manager and leading a group of people, I didn't want to do that initially. I just wanted to stay a hacker. But um, my lab manager, two levels up, basically said, Beatrice, you have a great vision for implementing this particular product. And you can choose to be the leader and lead that group, or we'll hire somebody else, and you're going to hate that. <laughs> And I thought about it, I said, yeah, I don't like telling, people telling me what to do, so I guess I'll become a manager. Um, and, uh, you know, I never looked back. It was something that, uh, that came naturally. So it's, I think it is very much a product of your environment, uh, as well as something that's inside you, but it's also something that you evolve into over a long period of time. Let me ask you, all of you, at what point did you sort of feel yourself 
switching from sort of a doer or a manager to being a leader of others? Mm. Well, um, I, I think upbringing it has a lot to do with um, sort of some of your paths in life. So I was the oldest child, and my father and I did a lot together. He treated me like uh, a first son. So I was the one changing tires with him and shoveling the snow, and um, he was always uh, the one teaching me. And so growing up, uh, he always would um, encourage me and applaud me for anything I did. Even if I wasn't very good, I probably didn't know it at the time, but they would come and cheer me on and tell me how great I was. And so I grew up with that sense of like, I can do anything. Um, but I probably gravitated um, toward more women's events, uh, being a brownie or a Girl Scout, uh, playing women's sports. Uh, and that's where um, I think uh, having that team spirit and working with people uh, is where I've kind of developed. And I see Debbie Meslow here. We were on a uh, National Women's Political Caucus. And when we weren't allowed to endorse Willie Brown or John Burton, we started our own organization. But it was always seemed like groups. And we would just step up. And you know, my dad would always say, go do it. And so if someone said, hey, we need someone to take minutes, I would take minutes. Someone you know, to go make deposits at the bank, I would go do it. And uh, gradually, it led to um, public service, being president of the Asian Business Association, which I never wanted to do. I thought I would get more clients. Um, but it's, again, it was like the team and advocating. And one thing led to another. And then you know, running for office seemed like the place where I thought I could make the difference. And that led me to you know, running for my first office. And then I really liked it, right? Because I could help people and impact, uh, level the playing field. And then I ran for my next office just because I could uh, and I was available. You know, politics is like musical chairs. When the music stops, if there's no chair, you're kind of stuck. <laughs> so I kind of had another opportunity and I ran for that. Uh, and then now this is my fourth elected office. And um, I think, you know, this is definitely my calling in life. Um, I don't necessarily want to do anything else. Nothing else motivates me. Um, but, uh, you know, it just, one thing leads to another, and I would say always be available uh, and willing and ready, and doors open up. I, I would agree a lot with Fiona about the upbringing part. I come from a family of three girls. There were no boys in the family, mm -hmm. and so my father did the same with me. I went hunting with him. I went fishing with him. He taught me how to use a pipe threader and a what you know, and all the wrenches and all the hacksaws and everything else. And um, he built this sense of competence in me, and that became the foundation for my being um, confident enough to start moving into leadership positions. But I didn't do that early in life. I, I, I. I was in the legal field, and so in the legal field, you know, you're in a firm, but you're really operating independently, or you're operating with, you know, a small team, and usually very hierarchical, and so there's not a lot of options for you to move out of your space in the hierarchy. Uh, and so the way I learned to start being a decision maker and a leader was to start going to joining groups, like I'd join the Bar Association and I'd go on the board of the Legal Services um, Board of Trustees and I was a s advisor at St. Mary's and I went on the BIA board and various places where, um, and I would just start by listening. And so the way I learned to become a leader was to watch for a very long time and then the natural progression is if you're willing to become a leader, you you're a member, you're a member, and then you start moving through the chairs, right? You become the recorder, and then you become the treasurer, and then you become the vice president, and so on. And, and the more you do that, the easier it is to, to be in the leadership role. And it became just easier and easier for me each time that I would move into one of those roles. And running for elected office, I will tell you, yeah. th that is, 
that is possibly one of the most challenging things that you could ever do. The fact that she's Fiona's run for four is, I don't know how she does it. Mm -hmm. I ran once and it, it, it was, um, in the words of, world, words of Charles Dixon, Dickens, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, <laughs> um, but it was my, my year of absolutely the most personal growth I ever had. So getting out of your comfort zone is also a really important way to figure out you, that you can do well at things you never thought you could do well at. You might not, but you gotta try it, and if you, if, it, if you don't do well and you hate it, then you stop doing it, but you gotta try it. So those were the two things. Yeah, and I think the path to leadership uh, is very different by industry and, and so on. So that's, that's one of the lessons to take away from this is there isn't any one path to leadership. It's multiple ways. So um, I was in a completely different environment. So I was in a large corporation working for Hewlett Packard um, that at the time when you were initially promoted into a leadership position puts you through a week-long training class of how to be a leader, um, how to write performance reviews, et cetera. And that was a, a grounding that I had that you know many people today don't have because you know the IBMs and the HPs of the world really don't aren't the same companies that they were uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, or 30, 40 years ago. Um, but once I became a leader, then you know the thing I was working on was very successful, and uh, you, you know then became promoted and moved on. Then I left HP. I started a company, um, and that that really brings it all home because. Uh, as a leader of a company, even if I, I wasn't the CEO, I was a co-founder with a, a couple of other folks, you, you're responsible for all of those people, right? So you have to make sure you can make payroll. Uh, if you're a small company, that's, not, that's sometimes an iffy proposition. Um, and, uh, and keeping the team motivated and keeping everything going, that really teaches you to reach deep inside yourself and find traits that you didn't think you had. So for me, it was a, a very different progression and one that just felt very, very natural. So, so far we've talked about the influence of families and parents, and one of the things we know from research is that um, in a family, if a father invests in the daughter, the daughter tends to be much more successful than you know, she otherwise would. Um, another thing is how much your teachers and the people around you uh, invest in you. My own personal experience on that is I went to a girls' Catholic high school. Um, there's recently been an uptick in interest in same-sex education in that, in that uh, age cohort, but uh, for me, there were nuns who said, you know, you girls are smart and you're gonna work. And when I look back and go to a reunion and I see given the milieu that I grew up in in New York, where you know the dads were cops and firemen and truck drivers, compared my high school to the high, the public high school in the same neighborhood, the women I graduated with have just like outperformed amazingly, and so I I give it up to the nuns who pushed. <laughs> um, I may not still be Catholic, but I love the nuns. <laughs> uh, so we've got we've got those influences, and then and then this insight about leaping and leaping forward and taking risks and getting out of your comfort zone. So I want to ask you um, to comment on something. Um, our own homegrown Nancy Pelosi is <laughs> Speaker of the House, and she's had a couple of things to say about power. Um, one of them is. No one gives you power. You have to take it from them. Mm. And another one is know your power. When you do, others will know your power too. Mm. So what do you think about that? Well, my initial reaction is that um, the first phrase, no one gives you power, you have to take it from them, it assumes that ha having power is a zero-sum game. And I, I don't agree with that. Premise, I think that power, there's plenty of power to go around for everyone who wants to take it and wield it. Um, and so the notion that I'm in a power struggle with a man or some other person is not something I think is a very productive uh, approach. So 
but I agree, if you just strike those last two words, uh, no one gives you power, you take it, absolutely, because no one is gonna give you power. I mean, why would they? Unless they want you to take the fall for some stupid decision they made. But, <laughs> but this, is, this is your responsibility. You have to decide whether you want to do this, whether you want to wield power, and if you do, you, there are many, many things you can do to take the power and use it. And that's what we're here to tell you about. No, absolutely. Uh, no one will give you power. It, title is not power. The power comes from within. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've observed over many, many years, and I've worked in a pretty much male-dominated industry. It was not unusual for most of my career to be the only woman in a room of 100, 200 guys. Um, and so that's just the way you know, high tech is. And the, what I observed from the very few women that I worked with um, was that they were often more tentative. They would come and offer me alternatives and ask me to make the decision for them. And you know, in my role as a, as a corporate leader, that's not what your role is. Your role is to, uh, I employ you because I want your judgment. I want your opinions. And I want you to come to me and say, look, here's all the data that I've looked at. Here's what I've researched. Here's my conclusion, my recommendation for what we do. And I discarded these other ideas because of these, these, and these reasons. And then I can ask probing questions um, but if someone comes to me and says, well, Beatrice, you know, I could do A or I could do B, what do you think? That's putting the ball on my court versus your court. And that, I find, is a more consistent trait with women than with men. And it's something that every woman that I've had working for me, I've had to educate her out of, which is you make the decision. You take the responsibility. If it's wrong, that's, that's on you. If it's right, it's going to be on you as well. But to, you know, people ask me, women ask me, how do I get promoted to the next level? You perform at the next level, and you then take it and you ask it, as opposed to work really hard at your desk and hope somebody will reward you. That doesn't work. It doesn't happen that way. And I give that advice to men as I do to women. You have to, if you want leadership, you have to be a leader before it's given to you. No, I, and I definitely agree with that. My um, my thoughts on power is that um, you know it's a it's a it's a discovery process, and um, it's something that um, um, it's internal. Um, you have to um, build this um, muscle of understanding who you are and who you are becoming more of before um, I think women can really step into their power. I don't think that power is something that's bestowed upon you. I think it's something that wells, uh, swells up from the inside. And, um, and you know it when a woman embodies power. P everyone knows it when she embodies power and, has, and may uh, uh, have a, a, a degree of positionality and title responsibilities um, for sure but you know it by the way in which she walks, the way she talks, the way she carries herself. And I'm not talking about taking on any characteristics that are, that are, um, are masculine, um, although um, there may be a, a femininity and a masculinity, or a masculinity with less femininity, however she shows up in the world. Um, that, it's not about those type of traits, it's about um, a sense of knowing that you're exactly where you should be, um, knowing that what you're doing is exactly what you should be doing and that nobody has um, the same capacity to do it just like you. And so to me, power is around, particularly for women, um, and my, a lot of my work has been um, looking at the intersection of gender and race. Um, and so, um, you know, my book is really focusing on that um, because that's clearly my narrative and story. 
um, as a as a as a as an African American woman um, that has been in one of the most hierarchical um, and oldest fields in um, you know American life, which is higher education. Um, you know, those institutions were not made for people who look like me. Um, and then over time, even as individuals like me were able to access those institutions, such as be able to become students and uh, undergraduate, graduate, what have you, they still were not made for individuals who look like me to serve as leaders. And so, uh, so fundamentally, you know, we engage, I have engaged, and women of, co of color engaged institutions um, in these leadership roles that we have these titles and these responsibilities and the institutions were never made for us to, uh, to be there to serve in a leadership capacity. And so what happens is that it's a, it's a internal process in which you do have to have coaches, you gotta have some people around you, um, but what I have seen is that women find their power along the way, regardless of the position that they're in. Um, and some of it um, uh, find it earlier than others. And so it's, a, it's an iterative process, it's an interior process. Um, and it is, um, uh, and I do think that the way in which women show up in their power, uh, when they find it and when they embrace it, is very powerful. And I'd like just to add uh, to Mary, um, mentors are really important. And in politics, it's pretty much a, a male dominated. Uh, industry, but I was lucky enough to get my first job opportunity with John Burton. And for those of you who you know uh, John Burton, uh, he now has uh, retired, but his foundation is supporting foster youth. Um, but the way he, um, you know, nurtured all of us and embraced us, um, it was never about power. Uh, even though John Burton does like to swear a lot, but he wasn't <laughs> yeah. swearing at us. We figured out that his swearing was kind of a, um, a, a what is it, like a um, his protection mechanism so that he didn't have to uh, sit in a room and listen to someone or have a deep conversation or, you know, solve a problem. So that was his way of um, kind of keeping everybody at a distance, but he had a heart of gold. And everybody who worked for John loved John. Um, you could never get a job with John unless someone, you know, quit or passed away. I mean, that's how much they loved him. And I think that's the way he assumed power. Uh, it wasn't because he took power um, or he asked for power, demanded it is because um, people just loved him. And that um, gave him power. When we were talking uh, in preparation for this, mm -hmm. Beatrice, you said something about about yeah. that. Do you want to? Yeah. yeah. No. And and um, uh, yeah. Just a, a story that I'd like to to tell um, is women are sometimes brought up from very early days to be passive. Um, and I remember my daughter, uh, who is a wonderful, independent, very strong young woman. She's in New York. Um, and uh, and uh, really a, a beautiful person. Um, I got the dreaded call every parent gets, your daughter's being disruptive. This is kindergarten. And, uh, <laughs> and I walked in, and the teacher was there, and there was a perfect little circle of little girls all sitting very quietly around the teacher, not moving, and all the boys were running around, as was my daughter. And I said, hmm. And I looked at her and I said, look, you may not call me again until every single one of these boys is sitting down as quietly as the girls. Then my daughter is being disruptive. Right now she's being one of the boys. Don't you dare ever call me again for that. And uh, she was kind of taken aback, but it was very clear that even at that point, you know, she was not at the, off the scales in terms of the people in the room she was off the scale versus the other girls in the room. And I had brought her up to question authority, to be independent, and to have her own thoughts, and, and to, to fight back if need be. And that was what she was being. So was she being disruptive? Yes, but so was half the class. So, <laughs> so it's important that, you know, as we bring up our children, our daughters, our sons, that we teach them that set of independence to really think independently, to look at data, to question what people are telling you, even if they're adults, 
because that will bring you good stead as you get to be older and have to push back against um, you know, your, your boss. Or when I first became a CEO, I was CEO of a public company. And I'd never worked for a board. And a board is kind of a weird entity. You don't work for them like you work for a, a boss. But one of the first things I had to do was I had to remake my board. And you know, think about figuring out how to fire your boss. <laughs> it's not so easy, right? So it, it was something, but it, I, by then, I, you know, I'd been in, been in business a long time. And I had that intestinal fortitude that said, I can do this. And I did. So, but it takes a long time to get to that level of confidence inside yourself. And it starts before kindergarten. The confidence inside yourself, um, I think also generates confidence that people have in you. And I, I know Beatrice and, and Fiona have both talked about this as we were prepping. Um, and the phrase that Beatrice, you used was, you know, you've got to be willing to take a bullet for the team. And it sounds sort of like the John Burton, you know, being willing, mm -hmm. you know, be, part of being a leader is, you know, having people being willing to, to follow you up San Juan Hill and, you know, and be happy about it. Yeah. And, and different people have different leadership styles. I remember, uh, again, this lab manager I had in my very first job at, at HP, uh, everybody loved him. It sounds like John Burton. Um, it, in retrospect, he was not a great manager. <laughs> he couldn't protect the group as well. But people would just, you know, they'd, they'd throw themselves off a cliff for him. Um, so that's one type of leadership style. Mine is more, you know, I'm not the general that leads from behind. I'm more a Teddy Roosevelt. I will charge up that hill. And I'm willing to take the bullets and I have people who have worked with me across companies for 20, 30 years, and you know they know I will sort of create that shield of invincibility as I'm going up the hill that will protect them from the bullets. But that comes at a cost, which is they have to be willing to do the same thing for me. And that's not for everyone. Um, some people can't, you know, for whatever reason, don't want to, can't give it that level of giving it all, and that's fine but you have to find your leadership style and find the people that fit that leadership style so both of you are comfortable in the relationship. There's people I've worked for that I would never ever work for again. There's people I've worked for that I would work for multiple times. And you have to find that comfort zone that you have of this is who I am and these are the sets of people that work well with me because you want that team, you want everybody working well together, because when you've got that, there's no other feeling in the world of having this you know, superstar team working with you to achieve a greater goal. And I would like to just like to add that um, taking that bullet, I think, is very, very important. Mm -hmm. You cannot get people to follow you for the long term if you are going to throw people under the bus. I don't know anybody that wants to work for someone like that. And if they are, every day they are worried that they are going to get fired or reprimanded. And people can't grow like that. So you have to um, accept that there are going to be mistakes. And you have to take the blame. Yep. You have to take the bullet. Uh, you cannot throw anyone under the bus. Otherwise, you cannot advance um, to higher levels. I'm looking out at our audience, and we've got a fairly broad age range, but we have a really good representation of younger women. So I'm going to ask you, for their benefit, um, if you were going into a new position, whether it's your first or your second job, and you would like to be successful, you would like to be a leader in whatever this chosen field is, um, what should they know now that maybe it took us 10, 15, 20, 30 years to learn about how to advance ourselves and how to step into those uh, higher level roles in whatever our professions are. Um, you haven't had a chance. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> so we all stare at you. you know, we don't have to go one after <laughs> anybody can jump in. The, uh, one, uh, yeah. one of the things that I struggled, I, I struggled with, with actually three things at the beginning of my career. The first was 
I was subordinating my interests to the interests of my boyfriend. And there are things I should have done that I could have done that would have been really remarkable right at the beginning of my career that I didn't do. And I'm so mad at myself for <laughs> doing that. Uh, and so uh, we weren't married. There wasn't a commitment there. It was just a, a, a mistake of a, a flaw of character that I had at that time that made me make that choice. Um, the second, so so looking out for your own interests first, not, not you don't, if you're madly in love with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever, you don't split up with them and say, screw you, I'm going to go over to Washington, D.C. Uh, I never want to, you know, if you want to stay together, then you start a negotiation. I didn't even start a negotiation. So that was one issue I had. The second issue I had was when I graduated from law school, uh, there was great pressure to go into a big firm, uh, and now there's even greater pressure going to a big firm because everybody's so inundated in student debt, to go into a big firm and to go into the litigation department specifically at the big firm. And, um, and I did that, and, and I really, really struggled with it, and I never sat down and tried to figure out why I was struggling with it, and what, I, what took me about eight years, because I would go from, I went from one firm, then I went to uh, the DA's office, and I went to the federal, uh, the Department of Justice, and I was in litigation in all of those positions, and what I discovered was I really wasn't a very good litigator. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I didn't like it. <laughs> and so what I, what I would do is I would, I would, I would uh, arrange my workload in such a way so I could avoid a trial at any expense. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and when I finally figured that out, I, I, went, to a, I went to a law firm. I, was, I, I got married, I got pregnant, and I had to move out to the suburbs. And, uh, and I, um, uh, I interviewed a law firm that wanted to hire me, and I said, okay, uh, two rules. I don't do trials, and I don't do interrogatories, but I'll do anything else. <laughs> and they hired me. Yeah. And from then on, I was as happy as a little clam because I was doing all the stuff I love, which was writ work and anything that, having to, anything that didn't have to do with me having to stand up in, 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 a, in a court and think on my feet because I just was not good at that. Uh, and then the third thing that uh, really held me back for about the first three years of my career was I didn't know the rules. I didn't know the unwritten rules. And I was probably, the th there were 65 in my firm. In the f It was a big downtown law firm. There were maybe 65 people. And I think I was the fourth woman that had been hired. One had already left. Two were still there. Um, they didn't come and help me out. I didn't even know how to ask them to help me out. I had no one there guiding me. I did not know the unwritten rules. And so I screwed up so many ways, so many ways. One of which I was told only three years after I left the firm was, you would come in every Monday morning and with a big bunch of flowers and you would spend 20 minutes arranging those flowers in a vase. <laughs> Do you know how off-putting that was? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> so those, so yes, having the mentor, having the, the person on the inside rooting for you, pulling for you, teaching you the ropes, huge difference. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and if you, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no I was just going to say, um, you know, this whole idea of, uh, we call it sponsorship, but I, I, if I were to go back, um, I would look for people that were transformative allies, meaning that people that um, recognize that they have significant capital. Um, it's social capital in the organization, it's political capital in the organization, um, it might even be financial capital. Um, and if you put all those things together, that generally means in most organizations um, in a U.S. context, most likely it's going to be a male, um, and even more likely it's probably a white male. And so if I were to go back literally 20 years from, uh, from where I was, um, uh, this particular time, I would have found a way to not look for a sponsor. I would have found and made relationships with influential and powerful white males, knowing that 
um, as a black female that the risks for me to take as a leader, as a manager, were so great, um, and if I failed even a little bit, that the consequences would follow me in a way where I would not be able to progress in the normal promotions, um, um, and um, there would be a narrative that emerges around uh, tonality, you know, the, the tone. Um, when I show up with the best of intentions, um, thinking that with my newly minted bachelor's degree, and then eventually my newly uh, uh, earned master's degree, and then a, eventually a doctoral degree, that all of those things are enough but yet at the same time, they weren't enough. And so one of the things that I've learned is that you have to have someone of power and influence and everybody in the organization knows it. Everybody knows that he has your back. And if you can find it in a woman, that's awesome. But you need to have a, a powerful male who um, has decided that he is going to be your champion. And, he, and you may have to teach him women's issues. Um, you may have to teach him issues about uh, women of color. Um, you may have to teach him racial issues um, so that he is better prepared and better equipped to become that champion for you. And so in many ways, you have to build your own champions. Um, just like you have to take, uh, 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 assume power, um, you also have to kind of uh, build capacity for allies, allies to become their highest and their best selves. And that doesn't happen naturally. You know, in, in research on how people succeed in their professions, um, there is a term, KIPP, Knowledge Intensive Professions. And what the research focuses on is that in a lot of professions, law for one, um, politics I'm sure, these are things where you learn by doing, you learn by uh, word of mouth knowledge that's handed down, and who gets that hand-me-down knowledge and that assistance is decided very early in the process, like moments after you're through the door. And if you're not picked out as the star, very early on, you've fallen by the wayside, go someplace else, find another job, start all over. And so this picking people, at, you know, having that idea of I have to identify myself as a star to this person who is influential is going to be important. So how do you do that? How do you identify yourself as a star? Well, for me, I want people who uh, are willing to work hard, uh, learn, uh, not look at their watches, not be concerned about their pay, um, but that's public service. <laughs> that is public service. But, you know, I spoke to um, a group of uh, CSU students, and they were kind of saying, well, how do we compete with, you know, the Ivy League students? What are you looking for? And I said, I don't look for Ivy League students. I want people who are going to be committed, who want to stay with me for more than a year, um, who are just happy and uh, excited to have a job every day. Uh, and for public servants, uh, you cannot be concerned with money. If money is something that you think of, having a nicer car, eating at nicer restaurants, buying fancier clothes, you're never going to make it in politics. Mm -hmm. um, you're either going to get in trouble, uh, <laughs> or you're going to end up right um, leaving because it, it's just not um, you know in the DNA. And I would say, as I have gotten older. Uh, when I turned 40, I started feeling more confident about myself, and that's because I got elected to my first office at 36 years old because my parents didn't want me to run for all these years, so I kept asking and looked, seeking their uh, approval. Finally, I got elected, and I felt pretty good. And as I get older, 50, I mean, I don't care as much anymore about what people think. Uh, and Warren Hellman, one of my mentors, Warren Hellman, uh, his uh, partner when he died at his funeral said, Warren always believed life is too short to deal with jerks. And that struck me. That I said, um, you know, I'm going to start practicing that. And so I try to get 
rid of people who have negative energy, take too much of my time. Um, and it has helped a lot in terms of my, you know, my mind, body, spirit being happy every day. And so that's what I strive to do. I don't want to get stressed. I don't want to, you know, hold grudges. I don't want to go to work every day, you know, being angry um, for me every day, like should be a happy day. Yeah. And I think also keeping in mind social capital, um, that was a concept I didn't understand for, for many, many years. Uh, but if I were to, you know, give my younger self advice, it would be to really not underestimate the power of social capital uh, and creating networks within organizations where you bring value to someone else and they bring value to you and then that becomes a self-fulfilling thing. So now uh, that's an alternate way of, you know, rather than having the person protecting you, you have your network of uh, influential individuals who protect you. Uh, both of those work, uh, but that's an alternative. Absolutely. And in addition, I think finding um, uh, folks outside of your organization that you can bond with. Um, you know, the, in the preparation, we, I talked about a um, friend of mine, colleague, she and I are on uh, boards together, uh, we teach together um, how to be on boards, etc. And she very recently started a, um, a small group for senior technology women who are at, at a point where they want to look at the next step in their lives. Do they want to be on a board? Do they want to be a CEO? Uh, do they want to take the next step up? And most of these are women like myself. They're, you know, they're working at companies that are very male intensive, Uber, you know, LinkedIn, uh, you know, companies that, that they are the woman uh, visible. And we just, you know, we take them out to dinner. Uh, there's a couple of us who are more senior people who can give them coaching and guidance of, boy, what should I do next? You know, I'm kind of unhappy where I'm at now. I've been there nine years. Should I move on? Um, you know, I think I might get a promotion in six months. Should I stay? That, those kinds of decisions, which you get to a certain point in your life, it's time to get help from people who have been there, done that and can give you a little bit of guidance. If you don't find such a group, create it, because it is incredibly invaluable to talk to other people in similar situations. They will help you because it will help them as well. It's a different kind of social capital, but it's a very important one. Uh, one of the things for young women, I think, in going into this sort of a new situation, um, you know, you've got to build your social capital, you've got to build your expertise, and one, you've got to ask questions, and I think what we're hearing is have a curious mind and learn as much as you can. So you've got to sort of go in with the mindset of what's the technical expertise that I need to be successful? What's the social expertise that I need to be successful? You know, what, who do I need to know within the company? Who, what do I need to understand about the way things work? And who do I need to know outside? And how do these networks all connect so that you can navigate your way through it? You can be a superstar. And one of the things um, that there's a, there's a famous mayor of New York, probably before your time, but a guy named Ed Koch. And Ed Koch was famous for going around New York and asking people, you're nodding, Fiona. Do you know <laughs> the quote? Yep. Go ahead. How am I doing? <laughs> and he wanted to know. I mean, he would ask anybody, and um, it's a good thing. People hate to give you feedback. Here's another thing to know. Early in your career, people will hate to tell you when you've done it wrong. So ask them, you know, how am I doing? How can I, how can I improve? Ask the people that you want to promote you, what should I know next? How do I get that knowledge? How am I doing? What do I work on? And if you ask for the feedback, they will give it to you and be so relieved if there's something that they were hesitating to bring up. Um, so let's, let's switch the conversation a little bit um, because I'm sure that all of us have experienced and probably many of the women, if not all of the women in the audience, have experienced situations where they felt that um, their words, their decisions were being undercut in some way. Um, so let's talk about those situations, what they look like, and 
share with the audience some ways that we have dealt with them. And again, what do you wish you had known about that mm -hmm. years ago? Mm. Yeah. So we're talking about things like you're in a meeting, you've got a great idea, you tell your great idea, everybody ignores you, and then two minutes later, a man says the same thing, and it's like, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> um, that happens. The other thing that happens a lot, and it's very interesting, this has, there have been a, done scientific studies on this. Women get interrupted by men mm. at meetings something like 15 times more often than either being interrupted by women or men interrupting men. So that's a cultural thing. We know about it and we need to handle it. And uh, it took me a while, but I would turn to the person who was interrupting me, male or female, and I would say, oh, excuse me, could I please finish? And then go on. It took me years to do that because the cultural setup was such that I just didn't feel like I had the power to do it. What's important is that I also didn't do it for the other women in the room. I could, if, if I see another woman being interrupted or mm -hmm. some idea being taken from her and, and uh, abducted and used as someone else's, then it's on me to say, oh, wait a minute, could you let her finish, please? I'm really interested in what she's saying. Or, oh, yeah, George. I think that's exactly what Judy said two minutes ago. <laughs> you guys must be, you know, on the same plane, <laughs> something like that. So there are ways to do it. It's, um, but it's scary when you're younger, when when you're the one of the very few women in the room, uh, when you you haven't developed a level of competence that gives you the confidence to just speak up because you know you're right. So it's a learned. For me, it was a learned thing, and the earlier you start doing it, the easier it becomes. Yeah. You can practice this skill at home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I speak from experience because I, my husband and our mutual best friend and I were having dinner, we're all in a heated discussion, and they started doing that to me. <laughs> I was like, Time out, guys! Do you know what you're doing? And they were, they were both like, who, me? You know? Yeah. Practice at home, practice with your friends, because they will do it and build up that, yeah. that muscle. Yeah, and don't assume that people yeah. exactly understand that. So I'm, you know, perhaps very odd. I'm in the unusual position. That's actually never happened to me. <laughs> so, but it's a combination of being a tech person in a tech company or multiple tech companies, tech is very egalitarian. It's really about how good you are. And you know, most engineers, including myself, are completely oblivious to these interpersonal things, right? So you can, you can go for good, good many years and be completely um, not realizing any of the personal dynamics, but no one else around you does, so it's okay. Um, but, but I think the important thing is, I, I was on a, on a board at one point um, and it was six venture capitalists and the newly named CEO and a founder. And the founder was unhappy at no longer being the CEO and he was downright disruptive. So this happens to men as well. He would interrupt the CEO every time he opened his mouth, he'd object and, and so on. And I'm sitting around, what are you, the six of you guys doing letting this continue? And you have to understand that there's a group dynamic where people are afraid to call that out. And I, just, and I just said, stop, Robert's rules of order. I felt like a kindergarten teacher. Okay, you get to talk. Ah, no, 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 that's it. You talk, and now you're done talking. Now you talk. No, you can't interrupt him. And after about half an hour, you know, people then started not interrupting one another. So it does happen, but there's a group think that that people get into that they don't want to call it out. And it isn't, and if they see it happening to someone else, they just, that's it. They just sit there and watch it happen. So you have to take control of the situation because in nine times out of 10, you know, unless you've got someone like you who's been through it, you may not get rescued. You may have to rescue yourself. 
You know, one thing that I was thinking of is that um, because I've been working um, with college age students, you know, the sum of my career, um, and obviously there's, a, you know, the kind of a traditional age college student and, and, and obviously there's adult learners, but particularly uh, what I've, I've witnessed um, over the last, I would say seven or eight years, but really in, in the last three to five years, is the ways in which um, the young women on my campus um, watching them organize themselves, watching them in their social cir circles, watching them in the classroom as I teach, that there is a, um, a capacity that they have if they have had, have had an opportunity to engage, you know, in some leadership development, um, and they have uh, a kind of a collective collectivist, um, you know, environment where they're engaged with other young men and young women, that um, I don't think that particularly the millennial women are having it the way and allowing that to happen in the ways that other generations have had it. And I see a couple of nods in the, in the um, audience. Um, and I've seen that change because that's part of my job as an educator, as someone that, uh, that is a student of the developmental process and the developmental process of young adults, of a young adulthood, and, and just seeing the ways in which they are challenging um, and their capacity to challenge. And uh, um, I'm not sure all the, the reasons why that's the case. Um, um, you know, there's various uh, theories out there um, on why that is. But um, one of the things I'm seeing, particularly even in the work face, you know, workplace, um, uh, the university is one of the most intergenerational workplaces around, you know, is the, at least five generations uh, currently, because you could teach for a very long time. You could teach into your 70s and 80s, actually. Um, and then there's a whole core of millennials, and then you have the baby boomers, which is a large core of the management. Um, then you have the, uh, uh, the, the student, I mean, the employees that are even younger than a millennial. So we just got the this wide range of people um, in this uh, this ecosystem called work. The millennials are the ones in my organization, and I know it's happening as well. Um, uh, and you know, universities are anchor institutions. They really are um, challenging. Um, processes. Um, they question. Um, they want to understand why things are the way they are. And um, and at times we've seen um, intergenerational. Um, not, I won't use conflict because that's a too I think too much of a word. Um, but um, they have to work it out um, in regard to how the millennials are showing up. And so I have great confidence as an educator uh, in what I'm seeing with the young women that are in, and that are um, in the spaces of learning um, uh, in post secondary secondary education right now. I think they I think they got it going on. And I would like to add millennials. Uh, we have millennials. Uh, Noah's here with me. Um, I have probably half my staff are millennials and they are much more confident I think than our generation where we wanted to be recognized. We needed that confirmation. We needed to be encouraged. I mean these young people, they're ready to go. They're ready to run for office. Um, you know, they, they, they never say no. They're ready to do it, which, which I love about um, their confidence. Uh, but I will say I try to get a lot of um, young people to run for office, uh, especially women. And it takes like seven times before a woman would run for office because they have to think about it. They have to check. Um, you know, ask around, you know, what does it take? Can I do the job? Whereas men, they self-select and they're like, I'll do it. I'm ready to go. Um, but I am uh, heartened to see that there were so many women that ran last year for office, many that have never run before that would never have done it. And they're like, you know what? We're angry. What, what's happening? And if not, you know, me, then who? And the women really stepped up. Uh, to run for office, but I will tell you it is a double standard when you run for office. The questions uh, they ask women um, when they are candidates, but I will also say it is probably the most humbling experience if you've ever run for office. Anyone have ever run for office? No? When you do, uh, and you go around and you ask your friends and family uh, to support you, they're usually like, oh great, yeah. I'll support you. Then you go, okay, I need to raise money. Can you cut me a check? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, 
I have to think about it. Let me see how you do, right? Uh, and you can weed out very quickly over the years, like who is your friend who has been there? Is like, I'm in your corner versus uh, I got to think about it. I'll get back to you. They don't return your phone call. They don't, don't donate money, right? I mean, politics, I think, is the true way to weed out the people in your life that are going to be supportive and love you and the people that are like trying to figure out how they're going to benefit uh, themselves. Well, at this point, I think um, let's open it to questions from the audience. Um, I think we've got uh, some microphones that uh, we're going to have the staff, the volunteers bring around so that everybody can hear the question. We've got people down here in the front. We've got people over. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for speaking. It's been uh, really delightful to listen to all of your stories. I'm from Stockton. I wanted to do a woot woot, but then I didn't want to scare the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I got to find her. Um, uh, and I really appreciated all of you talking about mentorship, allies, and knowing the rules. I grew up in a family where my parents are refugees from Laos. And so I had the chance to get to Berkeley and work at a big law firm. And I was so freaking clueless. I mean, you talked about the flower story. Somebody came to my office and said, you know what? Your cheeriness is so effing annoying. Can you just shove it? And I was like, whoa. It was, it was brutal. <laughs> and granted, I graduated chewing? in... Chewing? Uh, what was that? What did you say? You are chewing? Cheeriness. Cheeriness. Oh, cheeriness, yes. And I graduated in 2009 during the recession, so I think that might have had something to do with it, too. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, you talked so much about what you can do to be a protege or somebody that's a star, but how do you find who would be that quote-unquote transformational ally or that sponsor? Because often it's not easy to figure out who's doing what and who would have your back. So what are the qualities that you've seen have worked for you, and how do you sift that out? In your case, you know, with political, we donate money, then maybe, but maybe not. So I, I'd be curious from each of one of you how you have found that person. Thank you. Well, hey, I'll start. Um, I started my practicing law with a big firm and got assigned to a guy who was a total jerk. And, um, you know, I put in my year. I mean, when they assigned me to him, it wasn't what I had signed on to do. And I said, uh, you know, I understand you're short-staffed. I'll do this for a year. If I'm not happy, will you commit that I can move someplace else? And they said yes. And at the end of the year, I was not happy. Um, so part of it, I think, is, you know, keep your eyes open. And, you know, if you're in a bad situation, jump. You know, just jump. Um, but in the meantime, look around for those people who other people respect. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear people and you see how people react. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't take, it, it just takes keeping your eyes open to see who in the shop that you're in people think are really good and people think, you know, yeah, he, maybe that's a boss, but not one that you want to work for. Um, and those are the people the people that people respect are the people you want to ask for the opportunity to work with. Volunteer, see if you can, see if you can get the opportunity to work with that person, so that you can show them your stuff. Because they, you know, they're not going to open the door and say, "Oh, come in. I want to be your mentor." You've got to demonstrate to that person that you're really doing the work, you're showing an interest in the company, you're trying to learn about things, you're not just sort of in your cubicle. You're, you know, you're out there trying to meet everybody and trying to figure out, you know, this is what I do, but how does that interact with the person in that other department and how can I help them? And, and I would say you have to think about what you wanna do in life, right? If you want to run for office, you should contact me, you know, keep bugging me, call me, drive with me. If you want to be a chief of staff, you should reach out to my chief of staff. She's Filipina. She's amazing. She's organized. She's good with people, HR. Um, so you need to also think about what you want um, because I'm totally different uh, than Genevieve. Right, Joan? Uh, right, Noah? Um, and we're just different people, but she doesn't want to run for office, and I never want to really manage people in an office. So that's also part of, you know, beside working or looking for that mentor who you respect, um, kind of what you see 
your role in life is or what you want to do. Other, no? I think I've got the, uh, re oh, not God. remote, but whatever. Whatever this thing's called. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, Beatrice, you brought up the fact that sometimes you deal with supervisors who can't make a decision to save their life. And this is somewhat directed to you, but all the women as well. How do you um, move yourself forward when you've got a supervisor who, again, cannot make a decision, but you obviously don't want to step their bounds, but also prove yourself in that atmosphere? Um, some, one of the, the things that I've learned is that you have to figure out what situations, as you said, you have to walk away from. And sometimes um, supervisors who are unable to make decisions um, are going to hamper you forever. And so you need to decide and, and find yourself a situation because one of the things I've learned is you cannot fix that person. Um, I remember my very first job out of school. Um, our, you know, was a bunch of us. We, you know, were technical degrees, very young people, and there was the, you know, the lead, the team lead uh, was uh, a great guy. We loved him dearly, but he could not make a decision to save his life. So we, you know, my my cohort, <laughs> I, another woman, very strong-minded people. You know, he said, look, you know, we're now 10 people. You, you can't, you don't want to manage. So we hired a, a boss. Um, our decision making in terms of the qualities we wanted in a boss was, let us say, very poor. <laughs> and so we, uh, we thought management was you go to meetings. And so we hired a guy who liked going to meetings, which meant um, that we got to go to lots more meetings. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> eventually, my cohort and I decided we can't stand this anymore. And so we went to the guy and we said, we want you to leave. And he was a very nice guy, um, and he liked going to meetings. And so he actually said, well, yeah, I can see that. You know, I'll, I'll go find another job. But then we were back to our buddy who couldn't make a decision. Um, and, uh, and eventually I, I moved on because we loved him dearly, but that was just who he was. And you just need to make that, that decision for yourself. Thank you. Um, I work for an all girls, um, all girls high school, and I think we, some of you spoke um, about your experience as a child or even at an all girls school. Um, so I think that we do an excellent job um, empowering the next generation to be competent and confident, and, um, but they are almost in this bubble of there's so much support, and I, th I think it's great. Um, but when they enter college or the workforce, it, it's really shocking and it's really frustrating um, to, to be kind of introduced for the first time to the glass ceiling and um, to so many of the issues that um, they face as women. Um, so, excuse me, could you speak up? Sure. Yeah. Or Sorry. That closer. Do you want me to repeat yeah. that? Yeah. That's <laughs> Sorry. So, I work for an all girls high school um, and I think that we, I think we do a great job at empowering um, our girls to be. Um, to be leaders, to be confident, and to have those skills. Um, but then when they go into into college or into the workforce, they're really shocked and frustrated um, by like being introduced to the glass ceiling and to so many of the issues that um, they hadn't had to deal with in the past um, or during their um, single gender experience. Um, so, do you have any advice to educators or community builders within education to prepare them for that? Or is that, is that even important? Um, what would you recommend? I'd recommend they go to a girls' college, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm a smithy, and you know, I, I, I only applied to two schools when I went to college. Both of them were all girls' schools. It's the best decision I ever made because I got so easily distracted by boys. Yeah. It's my own care. I already told you about that particular character flaw. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful because I only had to deal with boys on weekends. And I could, uh, you know, attend to all of my work and everything else during the week. And so by the time I got to law school and I was in a co ed setting, 
it didn't matter because I knew how to handle everything. And I had reached a level of competence and a level of confidence uh, that, I mean, I don't know what it's like in a co-ed college, but being an all-girls college was really empowering for me. And so, I mean, I'm kind of answering you tongue-in-cheek, but there are other ways to, to explore those settings. You do it in social settings, you do it with weekend jobs, you do it with summer jobs, you do it in various ways. But I don't think the problem is that they went to an all-girls school. I really don't. I think there must be some other issue. Maybe they're overprotected at home. Maybe they barely had any social intercourse with boys at all in the course of their schooling, and that's the issue. I, I don't know. but. I just, I just don't think that's where the problem lies. Yeah, I would agree. Um, very quickly, I just want to say that I, I have been um, in the context as an educator and on a co-educational environment the 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 sum of my life, both personally, my own education, and as a, a provider of education. And so that you know, um, I believe in the the mission of public education. I believe in uh, private institutions that are, are have strong missions, like my current institution. Yet at the same time, because of my experiences, uh, both personally as well as um, the work that I'm doing to both support and retain um, and to hopefully, you know, facilitate a whole educational environment for the students that I work with, I recognize the value and I try to construct it even within a co-educational environment where if it's around gender, uh, whether it's around um, um, other identities, social identities, um, race, um, interest, whatever it is, I think there's a lot of value that people get when they're able to come together around a shared language, a shared culture, a, a, a shared way, a shared interest, because what it does, it gives them a chance to get stronger, and it gives them a chance to um, be able to um, uh, have a, a sense of who they are, even in the context of the greater society. One of the things is that the students are going to only be in school for a, a certain period of time. This is a time for them to be able to come together and, and um, um, build that capacity that they're going to need. So I agree. Um, I can always tell somebody that has come out of a single sex educational experience. I can also tell people that have come out of Catholic school educational experiences. There's certain characteristics that are identifiable to me as an educator when I'm dealing with them, whether they have transferred into my institution or I'm dealing with them as a professional. Um, as she has said, it's rare to find a woman that has come out of a single sex educational experience um, that is not innately confident. And so if she has to deal and, you know, and manage with the realities of, 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 uh, of structural inequity, just like you know, people of color have to deal with um, you know, structural inequities um, as they go out into work, because black children, you know, they grow up in loving black homes, and then they kind of go off to school, and then all of a sudden, how do they, you know, they have to understand, like, oh my good, you know, uh, everything is not equal for all people at all times. And so they have to come to grips with that, and they have to learn how to manage that. But yet, at the same time, that environment of, uh, of support um, is actually the anchor that will hold them when they need it the most, and so um, so I would so I would I would say that um, uh, maintain those experiences so they can get really strong. <laughs> and, and I would agree. Um, I meet a lot of people in my job over the past twenty five years, and I can tell you, it doesn't matter man or woman. Um, it's just there's personalities right in both. Um, whether you're friends, whether you're colleagues, whether you're a boss. I mean, there are good legislators that are men, uh, and there are bad women legislators, right? There's men that um, love, the, their staff loves them. There's women uh, that their staff loves them, and there's um, women that their staff hates them, uh, right? So as you're kind of moving up, I don't think it's, you know, one sex or one religion or race or creed. Uh, I just think it becomes people, right? And if, like they said, if you can connect 
with people um, that share maybe your values, that you know you want to see the world a better place, right? You want to be positive. I mean, those are the people I look at. So I wouldn't say going to an all-girls all school um, hampers them in any ways. I just think that it's just life. You know, men and women, you know, we grew up differently and uh, we have different management styles. We have different insecurities, uh, different ways to lead. And um, I don't think it's, it's, you know, it's because you go to a, a girls' school. Well, I, I would say that confidence is, is really important in that training that you get. But um, it's also really important to be prepared for things. And, you know, if you want your students not to be surprised when somebody grabs them or says something inappropriate, you know, I think you tell them this can happen and think today about what you're gonna do when that situation happens and practice. You know, how are you gonna respond if somebody says that to you or if somebody does that to you? Um, you know, that's part of what we've got sort of in our toolkit without even thinking about it because, you know, you, you go through things and, you know, you know how I know how I'm going to respond if somebody cuts me off. Mm -hmm. um, you need to tell your students these are the kinds of things that may hamper you. Here's what you need to be. You need to be able to do this. Go practice. Yeah. Get in groups of three. Your job is to cut her off at some point, and your job is to leap, to leap in and correct that behavior. Now practice it and then change roles. Do we have time for like another question? No, sorry, we have to wrap it up. Well, thank you all. You've been a, a wonderful audience with great questions and a wonderful panel.